uh, from Munich, my my friend <coughs> Anja Zimmerman. Hi, Anja, can you hear us? Uh, yeah, you can probably hear us, but we don't hear you. Okay. Okay, now it works. Hi. Ah, now it works. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Good, good. How are you? Uh, Anja is a... Um, is a, is a uh, tech transfer professional with Asinion. Asinion is, a, is a formally a private company that manages uh, intellectual property for a number of research institutions in, uh, in, uh, in Germany. Uh, and Anja particularly is uh, the person in charge for equity management. So she deals with uh, startups and spin-off, uh, negotiating for equity position, uh, managing the portfolio of startups and then discussing exits and all these funny activities that typically uh, venture capital uh, do, but she does it internally for for uh, a senior. Um, uh, Anya will talk about uh, the journey from research to patent. Anya herself is a, is a scientist, by the way, by education, even if she um, holds an MBA and of course, she is exposed to business and management every day, but by, by education is a, is, a, is a technical person. So Anya, without further ado, we leave the floor to you for your uh, contribution. And thank you for being here today, somehow. <laughs> so thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to, to give a talk. I'd, I'd rather be here with you, I admit, but uh, yeah, un unfortunately not this time. So um, yeah, as, as Marcia already said, um, I am supposed to say something about uh, how to get from research to, to patent. Now I'm just connecting the clicker. It does work. So, um, yeah, I was asked to um, say a little bit about the company I'm working for um, to, um, yeah, hopefully to explain why, why I hope to be capable of giving this talk is all at all. Then um, a short uh, introduction to what is IP actually, and then um, uh, how to get from an invention to a patent. And I would like to finish if there is still time with uh, a few success stories. Okay, so let's start. Um, the company I'm working for, Asinian, is uh, in, in operation since 2001. Um, and uh, we are, it was initiated by public institutions and we are ISO 9001 certified. And our goal is actually to bring uh, research into application, which also is, um, uh, can be seen in our mission. Our mission, our official mission is uh, advancing technology into application. Um, and of course, that, that goes together with um, securing our partner institute's IP, which I will mainly talk about today, but, but also um, realizing financial returns, actually making money out of, uh, out of this research. And the money we make uh, in the end goes back to to uh, the partner institutes and goes back to research. Um, at a glance, uh, currently we're working for 26 life science institutes, uh, not only in Germany, but also in Austria and some other countries, European countries. Um, during uh, the time we're in operation, so more than 20 years, there were 18 products brought to market, 32 products under development, and every one of you who works in the life science field, which we are solidly working in, um, knows that this bringing a product, a therapeutic, uh, a diagnostic um, or a medtech product into market is, is both costly and, and time consuming. So we're quite happy about that. And we had or have equity in 58 companies. Um, and that results in the end in more than 110 million uh, in revenues for, for research or returns for research. Um, that's us. Um, we all, almost all, have have a background in biolo uh, biology or other natural science. We have some lawyers, as you, well, you cannot get by without lawyers these days, so uh, you need a few of them. We are 30 people, um, and 
yeah, we have seven locations in Germany. Uh, you can see them. That's the big red dots and the small red dots, although much bigger than us. That is our clients, uh, which in the end is uh, more than 5,000 scientists. And all these scientists, they, they do incredible work and uh, they have very, very good ideas. And here we are. Um, how to how to uh, get from research to a pattern. So um, the question is, what is IP? As I just mentioned, um, all these scientists, they, they have uh, brilliant ideas. Um, and uh, of course, the, the question always is um, what to do with these ideas or creations of mind and intellect IP or intellectual property actually is a legal concept. Um, it is, it, it means that exclusive rights are recognized for said creations of mind. And wherever there's a legal concept, there of course is also law um, that makes sure that the, the creators or the, the owners of this IP are given exclusive rights. And these exclusive rights, they come in uh, different types, which, which uh, I will discuss a bit more in depth later. Uh, for us in tech transfer, um, patents and trademarks are by far the most important IP rights. So um, now, if you are an inventor, very often you have um, an interest to keep the invention secret. With academic researchers, of course, that's different as uh, you want to publish. However, um, uh, quite often, especially if you want to make money from it, um, you want to uh, maintain your invention secret. The interest of the public, however, uh, is, is uh, completely opposite. Um, you, you want um, to have new technologies, new ideas, new concepts available for the public that other people can pick up those ideas and, and maybe develop them even further or, or uh, broaden their knowledge. So what is the solution to that? The solution is um, a patent in the end. Uh, it is a time limited exclusivity for the inventor. But in exchange for that time limit exclusivity, you have to disclose your invention to the public. Having said that, oh, okay, good. I would like to um, talk about a few uh, ways to, to protect your IP. Um, one is, of course, trade secrets. Uh, the most famous one, probably the uh, recipe for Coca-Cola. Um, Coca-Cola, the company, they managed to keep uh, this, this, this trade secret actually secret for, for decades. Um, and uh, so it, it might be a way to go forward, but not for an academic researcher, of course. And even if you uh, have a company or plan to form a company, you have to be careful as um, Somebody might tell uh, the secret um, and then it's lost uh, or what's even worse, a third party files a patent and, and which, which might cover your invention and then you as the inventor are not even allowed to use it anymore. Then there are copyrights. Um, I think everyone knows about copyrights. Um, they offer very strong protection and uh, they are um, uh, they give protection for for yeah um, works of the mind so to say for for books for music for art but also for scientific publications or computer programs so um yeah this but this is a a, a, a protection right where you have to do nothing to gain it um you just it's it's just your your natural right so to say um so after trade secrets and copyrights, um, the question might arise, what actually is 
uh, the right uh, kind of rights for, for what technologies. As I said before, um, we are primarily dealing with patents on a, on a small, very small scale with utility models or variety protection, but in our day-to-day -day work that doesn't it doesn't play a, a role. Um, and there are non-technical protective rights, uh, which we have to deal with sometimes. Um, that's trademarks. Um, some of our clients filed a few trademarks, but it's only two or three uh, over all those years. And then designs and copyright. Copyright being important for, more important for, for software, uh, software rights. Now, how do you actually um, get there? How do you get a patent when you have an idea? Um, so as a researcher, if you, if you have a novel idea, um, created some new material, for example, uh, a new knockout mouse, uh, an antibody, um, you ha have new data or discovered a new method, um, is, is it actually uh, an invention. So what, what we first ask our researchers to do, well, our researchers, yeah, in the end they are, um, we ask them to, to check uh, the state of the art um, and then find out is this idea actually new or um, is it already out there somewhere. Um, and then to ask themselves uh, the data, the data obtained, or, or the idea, is it is it actually surprising, or or was it obvious? Um, and then the next question is, could the idea data be used commercially? So that's the first check, which actually I will talk about a bit more later because that's also the the requirements for for um, obtaining a patent. And then. Um, the next question is which kind of invention is addressed? Um, are third parties involved? That's always, or that that might be a problem. If there are third parties involved, uh, there always comes the question of ownership: um, who actually owns the patent? Um, and if they, if if the scientists, they thought about all that I, uh, these ideas, an invention disclosure should be filed. Um, how that works would, would require another talk, probably, um, with all that stuff about uh, employees, inventions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I will not um, discuss that further a lot. So as I said, um, uh, once this is done, um, we think about shall, should a patent actually be filed because it's it's a lot of work and it costs quite quite a lot. So. Um, Technical and economical requirements should be fulfilled. First of all, is is your is the idea, the novel idea, patentable? That means is there a chance to get a patent granted, which I will describe uh, in a few minutes. And then, uh, what is as important is it actually patent worthy? That means um, you might get a patent, but if you if you cannot make money out of this patent, so why would you actually file one? Um, let me, so, is there a market potential? Is there any any route to commercial exploitation? Is there any way um, you, in the end, um, you might make money from the patent? So that's the two questions actually to be uh, answered. Now, to so the first one: Is the invention patent patentable? The requirements to uh, obtain a patent: it's novelty, inventive step, and commercial applicability. Novelty, um, it's quite easy. Um, it has um, to be absolutely new, meaning um, before the day of filing the patent application, the invention cannot be disclosed nowhere, neither written nor oral, nor as a public use, etc., etc. Um, and neither by the inventor nor by anyone else. Um, this is crucial for, for uh, patentability and uh, we always try to educate our scientists to be very, very, very careful with that. Meaning uh, 
no discussions with, with outsiders, so to say, um, no talks at conferences, being, being very careful when submitting a paper because some more, sometimes there is an e-publication before, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's really um, crucial. Uh, next thing is the inventive step, which, is, um, which means that the invention has to be beyond the state of the art. That means um, when combining the information that's already out there, um, your invention cannot be obvious. Um, and the question we ask our, our scientists very often is, is, is the solution you had, is it, was it expected? Uh, was it part of a standard development? Are the results surprising? So that is inventive step. And the last uh, requirement is commercial applicability. Um, so that's the, the possibility to actually um, use and and in the end sell your invention. That's that's an easy one. Um, when you when you look what look what patents what kind of patents were granted, you you probably would be surprised to see what kind of inventions um, are uh, were thought to be commercial uh, applicable. There is one I remember, uh, that's actually a machine which claimed to use, to want to use a centrifugal force um, with, with uh, women giving birth to actually, uh, yeah, uh, get the baby out. So that is, was, was a very, very strange granted US patent. Um, and uh, if, if uh, examiners thought there's a commercial applicability for that, then there's commercial applicability for more or less everything. So, and the next, um, is, it, it is, is it worth to patent the invention? Um, we, what we do is we assess the, the technology, we uh, try to find out if it would be able to complement technologies, if it is better than known technologies, if it might uh, contribute to existing portfolios. Um, we try to find out if there is a market um, and we also try to um, estimate the expected patenting cost versus potential revenues. To give you an example, um, you can patent monoclonal antibodies as research tools, not as diagnostics or drugs, that's another story, but as research tools. Um, you can patent them, however, the money you're going to make with them uh, normally does not, uh, is, is not more than, than the patenting cost. So we, we just don't patent them and license them anyhow. So that I think is also a quite, quite um, important aspect to, to consider. Okay. So next, when is an invention disclosed? As I said before, novelty novelty is is crucial. So all the the um, communications I am listing in this uh, in this slide, um, they are they destroy novelty. That means there shouldn't be any of them um, before you file a patent. That's, that's something we always discuss with our researchers. We always ask them or beg them to, to file the patent first and publish later, because once it's, once it's published, um, the, the possibility to get a patent is, is reduced to zero, unfortunately. And we lost quite a few, not too many, unfortunately, but quite a few interesting technologies to, to, to that. Now, um, what, what actually can be protected by a patent? Actually, a lot. Um, um, anything technical, so to say, that can be compounds or compositions, also uses, production processes, uh, procedures and, and methods, uh, even a modified or and a lot more, um, which, you, which you can see in this slide. There are also um, 
things that actually cannot be protected by a patent, which are scientific discoveries, uh, scientific theories or discoveries. If, if, if NASA discovers a new planet, they cannot patent it. Uh, plants and blueprints, um, also the human body or parts thereof, and, and uh, other than uh, in the US, clinical therapies. The reason for that is that you don't want uh, a lawyer enter, entering the, the operating room and, and, have, uh, and be able to stop a procedure. And then, of course, inventions uh, which offend the order of public or are immoral or against the law. Um, if I'd start on the human stem cells uh, debate, uh, we probably wouldn't be finished for another few hours. Now, um, who owns the right to an invention? Uh, I was told that, that uh, today's audience uh, consists of quite a few researchers. So. Uh, as a basic principle, of course, the inventor, that's you, uh, owns the invention. But uh, if you are an employee, um, you have to disclose the invention to your employer and um, then uh, the employer will decide or it will be decided whether uh, it is a service invention and then the employer has the right to gain the invention and, and, and to retain ownership. Um, and if it's no service invention, um, then it's free and you're free to do with it what you want. However, um, just because you always have to disclose uh, your invention to your employer. And uh, once that is established, once all of that is established, uh, who is the owner? Is it patent? patentable, is the invention patentable, is uh, the invention um, patent worthy, you start with a patent application. Um, what we do, quite often do, is we start with a national application. For us, it's mostly German. Uh, for you, it might be Italian, probably is Italian. Uh, that's relatively cheap. Um, and at least in Germany, I don't know about the uh, Italian uh, patent office. You get a first office action. You get some reply from, from the examiners within uh, 10 months. Um, and you also can can go with a regional application what we also do quite quite often uh, we do a european application that's one application for 31 contracting states um, which is it's quite nice um, and uh, there you get uh, also some some preliminary report from the from the examiners before uh, before the first 12 months are are over And then uh, there, of course, is the in international patent application. It's called PCT application. That's an option to file uh, a patent or a patent application uh, in, in a lot of states, as you can see. And, and the, the uh, procedure is, is quite similar. You also get a uh, search and opinion um, and an examination, and then it will be deci uh, decided if, if uh, the patent is granted or not. And there may or may not be opposition proceedings, meaning someone is uh, opposing your, your patent. Um, with the EP, what we do, uh, mostly because the examiners in the European Patent Office, they are quite good in the life science field. So you get a search report, um, that means an opinion uh, whether your patent is novel, inventive and uh, commercially applicable. Um, and once that is done, the examination starts, um, that goes back and forth um, between the patent office and uh, the patent attorney, patent lawyer. And uh, once it's finished, the patent is e e uh, there's either a grant or a revocation, meaning you have the patent or, or you don't. And after grant, uh, as I said, there might or might not be opposition proceedings and the national phase start in some countries, meaning after the European patent is granted, you have to decide in which of those said 31 states you actually want a patent and have to go from there. Um, that's kind of uh, the timeline you can see here. Uh, you start with a priority application, you get a search report. Um, after a year, you start the uh, international application. 18 months after your priority uh, application, your patent application is published. Uh, 
uh, in the meantime, you will receive an international search report and uh, a preliminary report uh, of patentability. And then you decide about the states which, which actually you want to patent in. Um, the little maps below, you can see all the, the countries uh, that are in the PCT uh, world, so to say. And in green on the right, you can see uh, who is a partner in the European Patent Convention. Um, well, is there a time limit for patent protection? Yes, it is. Um, it is 20 years. Um, so once your patent is granted, uh, you have 20 years of protection starting from the first application or priority application. In the, U in the European, well, in, in the European uh, Union, in the European area, there is a possibility of uh, getting five years extra um, under certain circumstances. And also in the US, uh, you, have, you have ways to protect, um, especially drugs, for a longer time. Um, as um, you have to pay your patent attorney, you have to pay fees to the patent office, you have to pay for translation, um, you have to pay for maintenance, etc, etc, etc. I listed the, the costs in the slide. Um, and as you can see, if you have a patent and you want it uh, granted or have that patent in, in quite a few countries, this uh, easily uh, over the lifetime of the patent uh, goes up to a six digit uh, range in euros. So this is, is really a lot. So that means before you patent, you, you should have that in mind and actually decide whether it's possible to, to get um, this money back plus something extra uh, for, for profit. So, um, what we what we do or as a researcher if you want to get an idea whether your idea is, is already patented or not you can do a patent search there are quite a few free databases you can use there's also google patents of course which is uh, getting better and better every day um, so that also might be something you you want to you want to try out um, i think i already um, talked a little bit about that, um, to patent or not to patent. Um, is the question about the market and the value. Um, however, um, also the ultimate purpose of patenting should be commercializing. We are, we are very aware um, of the fact that, that patents uh, might also be important for, let's say, strategical issues. So um, national bodies might require uh, research institutes to have a certain number of patents to, to continue funding um, for uh, an inventor, for a researcher. It might also be important to, to have patents in their CV, so to say. So that's, that's also uh, important reasons to, to keep a patent. However, as I said, the ultimate purpose of patenting should be com commercialization. Um, the common tools are either collaboration, a joint development, licensing or sale, um, or building a spin-off. Um, I took a look at the program, so I'm pretty sure uh, there are talks about uh, all these uh, all these topics, uh, collaboration, licensing, spin-offs, so I won't go into that. And I just want to mention um, um, there are uh, a lot of technologies actually um, and, and well-known ones that were developed um, at, at governmentally funded research organizations. These are um, examples from the US and, and Europe. Um, Epothelone is, is uh, a, a drug against cancer. A um, lot of antibiotics, for example, were, were uh, developed in, in uh, research organizations. Cisplatin, uh, another uh, anti-cancer drug, 
ibuprofen. I think probably everyone in the audience um, took, took a few of those during their lifetime. Um, then very importantly, of course, recombinant DNA technologies and, and, and genetic engineering of animals and plants. CRISPR-Cas is uh, a current example. There are others, of course, as well. Um, MP3, actually everyone uh, with a smartphone um, knows MP3. Um, that was developed at, at the Fraunhofer Institute here, here in Germany. So we are especially proud of that, of course. Um, MRI, um, cardiac catheters, and even the Hoovercraft. And uh, that I think, uh, I hope, highlights securing IP actually is um, to, to make sure that, that it can develop it can be developed further and, and uh, actual products come, come out of it. Here's even more. Um, there are some, some drugs which sell very, very well. Um, these were all developed uh, in the US, some of them uh, from very well-known uh, institutions, Memorial Sloan Kettering, New York University, et cetera, et cetera. And um, actually it is, it is like 50%, uh, well, more than half of, of innovative new drugs actually aren't developed in pharma companies themselves, but they start in, in SMEs or, or academia. And uh, so I think that's, that's the last slide. That's actually a few of our products, which were developed in, um, in, in uh, departments of, of research institutions we are working for um, and were brought to market um, while we were working on it. Um, there are a few therapeutics. Um, quite, quite some are currently in, in uh, the clinical pipeline, which uh, for, for those we are very hopeful. There are quite a few diagnostics um, medical technology and, and on the back, which you see here, that's actually, um, if you, if you go to, to mostly Asia, you might find our bitter blocker in, in some soft drinks you, you can, you can buy over there. And then of course, um, yeah, Masi already said, I'm mostly dealing uh, with the spin-offs. There are quite a few successful spin-offs. Um, Heparogenics, one of them that deals with liver failure, cardio, cardio pharmaceuticals, who had a, a financing round last summer, over 60 million. T knife, uh, which had a financing round of over 110 million also last year. Um, we're um, keeping our fingers crossed for their products. They haven't reached the market yet. However, they are all in clinical trials. Um, and yeah, I hope that. Um, with this, with this talk, and I am on time, um, as we as we still have some some minutes remaining for for questions. Yeah, with this talk, I hope I I was able to to give you an idea why we think that um, it is very important to to secure IP. That is very important to always have uh, the possibility of finding a patent um, in mind. And yeah, with that. Um, thank you very much. And uh, if you have questions, just go ahead. Uh, th thank you very much, Anya. Uh, I'm Ricardo Pietravisa. I and unfortunately, my... I can't hear you. Uh, you can't hear me? Can you hear me? Non sente. So I still can't hear you. Is, you, can no, you hear I me? can hear you. Perfect. Okay, yes. Okay. Yes. Thank, thank you, Anya. It's, uh, uh, I'm Ricardo Pietravisa. I, I uh, substitute to Mac Massimiliano that, uh, uh, that leave uh, five minutes ago. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for, for your presentation. I, I greatly appreciate your capability to synthesize all the key points related to IP, in particular for for translating uh, uh, research uh, into uh, ownership of uh, invention. So this is a very important key point. So I ask firstly if uh, there are some questions from the floor here. Uh, 
uh, otherwise uh, uh, we have received a couple of questions from uh, from uh, the audience uh, online in particular both from uh, uh, three now uh, two from uh, Roberto Gramignoli uh, the first uh, um, referred to the to the fee to the payment uh, for uh, for patent uh, because uh, he said that patent submission by sponsor um, if sponsor and inventors are different entities who owns the right of commercialization this is the first question and the second uh, from the same person is can you comment about professor privilege rules uh, in Italy and in Germany because we you know that uh, in the past in Germany too there was a uh, professor privilege now there yeah. is no more while in Italy we established Professor Privilege uh, in 2001, and now is still is still active. So these first two questions. So please. yeah, um, the the first the first question regarding payment. Um, the right of commercialization, of all, depending on the uh, I suppose no. on the ownership when something is paid by a sponsor. Exactly. So um, you, first of all, you have to uh, establish who owns the patent. So if the research institution, let's say, owns the patent, uh, they have the right to commercialization, uh, regardless of who, who actually pays the fees. Uh, but um, I assume that any sponsor wouldn't pay anything uh, if they hadn't secured the rights. So there is, is probably always a, a contract in place um, where this is addressed. So what, what we see, for example, if, if we do a licensing agreement or a collaboration agreement, we all, always try the company uh, to, to, to have the company pay for, for the patent fees. However, the ownership should always remain with the research institution. So this is what we try. Um, the second question regarding professor's privilege, I, I remember very, very well. It was uh, February 7th, 2002, where in Germany the professor's privilege fell. And there was a huge uproar. Um, I think um, I prefer not to have the professor's privilege because of uh, a number of reasons. First of all, um, the professor only is able to, to perform his research because he is situated somewhere in a research organization. Uh, so that means the research organization also should profit from, from the research because it was funded by taxpayers' money. So any, any, commercial, any money that comes back from, from the invention should also, I think, again, benefit the public. Of course, I mean, in, in Germany, uh, if you are a professor, um, the inventors, they always get 30% of everything that comes in. Don't get me wrong. So, so if, if uh, there, is, there is a commercial success, um, that will also be a commercial success for all the inventors. Uh, that's the first thing. And the second thing is that um, I think with us as a professional technology transfer organization, um, we just make better deals. We had in the past um, an example of a collaboration with, um, with a company where his IP would go into the company and that wasn't possible because the professor's privilege fell um, and he wanted to give away uh, his IP for a payment for one PhD and 50,000 in, in lab equipment, you know, consumables. And uh, we managed to, to make a deal where uh, that was more than 20 times uh, the return. Okay, thank you very much, Anya. In, in, indeed, the, the third question was uh, also related to uh, professor privilege in Germany, but uh, we already uh, answered to this question. Um, if there are no more questions, I'd like to, to point out briefly um, a problem that uh, Anya um, said before about uh, publication, scientific publication yeah. and, uh, and patent, yeah. which is a problem of uh, time relationship indeed, <laughs> which is first. But 
um, in particular for researchers who are not aware about IP uh, regulations, uh, it's, it's very important to, um, to define exactly which is the difference between the two, because also the patent is a publication indeed. Uh, you can download right. this publication, right. read and, and learn yeah. with, with patents. So, but we, which is the difference uh, uh, between a, a scientific publish publication on a peer review, review journal or a patent? I, I want to, to, to think of three major points. The first, scientific publication is based on scientific rigor, originality and significance for the community. Uh, while patent is based only on novelty and, uh, and the inventive step. So it's completely different uh, the, the way to uh, admit for publication the first or the second first point. Second point, the patent enable, uh, the, the publication enable the, the community to learn a lot about some new knowledge. The patent objective is to prevent other to use so it's not it's not written to explain but to prevent what should be uh, used by others and the difference is that while the first is knowledge the second is invention and invention is how to use some knowledge to solve a problem that's not necessary is required in any scientific publication publication is not to solve a problem is to is to communicate knowledge. Um, so these two differences are, are, are completely get graded, completely different uh, uh, role to the two and the role of research in the two. So it's very important for researchers to understood that writing a, a patent is completely different as writing a paper. It's not the same thing for the different mission, the different goal. Uh, and the different uh, also time for that. So be aware that to write a good patent, you need you need uh, uh, people aware of writing pa patent. While to write a scientific paper, you need other kind of uh, uh, of skills. So this is very much. I important. couldn't agree more. Yeah. Uh, because it's, it's very often um, uh, research uh, we are not aware of what IP think differently to to uh, as we know about how to write and what to write in, in, uh, in scientific or in IP uh, paper, let me say. So I, I invite all of you to begin to read patent to understand the difference between scientific publication and IP publication. So, uh, yes, there is a question from the floor. Yeah, hi. Yes, please. So my question is the following. Um, I understand that when you have a product that was developed in an academic setting, which required a whole lab, a whole investment, it's, it makes sense to share the profits. But are the rules the same like when you produce a product that is just essentially coming out from your head in a computer? So like, is quantitative work that can be patented uh, subject to the same rules? of other types of works that are that required a lab or some much more invest, initial investment is it still the same rules it's the same um okay you have two more very very brief uh, because we are uh, late and uh, the first from uh, uh, fabian baumark gartner uh, they ask uh, if uh, you in your experience anya do you advise to keep early licenses on IP non-exclusive? Huh. Um, that very much depends on the technology. Um, when when um, you have something that might end up as a drug, you only can go with exclusive because no pharma company would, would um, would do that would, would invest all that money that's that's required for for um, preclinical stuff clinical phases etc etc that's millions and millions so they wouldn't go for an exclusive license there are other um, examples for example um, research material we only license that non-exclusively um, 
So I think it's 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 not so much for uh, regarding the 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 phase um, the the technology is in early or late. It's it's uh, in the end um, it depends on on the, the the later product. What you also can think of, uh, however, is field licenses that you that you um, give an exclusive license, but only for a certain field of application, when you have a technology at hand that might be applicable in, in different fields. Um, thank you very much. The last, the very last one uh, from Giovanna Campogiani. Um, this is very technical question. The, the, <laughs> They say uh, maybe I'm going off a topic, but do you think that the unitary patent court will impact patenting in Europe for research organizations? Uh, I, I want to explain that the, uh, at present patent uh, uh, are active in just one country. Um, so if you want to have a patent valid in different countries, you need more than one can, uh, patent. Uh, now there is a new regulation that enables to have a, a European, no, a U union patent that should be defended by a, a unitary patent court in all Europe. So this change, um, the, the, the two, the two system will will live together indeed. But we, this will change uh, uh, probably the strategy. Please, Annie. I mean, what we what we hope is and that that remains to be seen what we hope is that it makes the unitary patent makes things easier and cheaper if if that is actually the case um, i think uh, it will make um, things easier for research organizations as they just do not have the massive uh, um, amount of money to 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 find and maintain patents as as companies have the budgets, the patent budgets in, in research organizations quite often are, are much lower. Well, thank, uh, thank you very much. Uh, 